Hello, and welcome to the third episode of season two of the ESG Experience podcast brought to you by Conservis ESG, formerly GOBI. I'm Healy Lev, GOBI's Chief Revenue Officer. And I'm Ryan Nelson, Conservis ESG's CEO, and we're your hosts for this podcast. Whether you're an ESG expert or just dipping your toes into the ESG universe to understand how it can help with engaging stakeholders, mitigating risks, and attracting investors, this podcast is for you. Together, we will navigate the alphabet soup of ESG, discuss ideas, review strategies, and share industry news and trends. In this episode, we'll be discussing the relationship between ESG and risk management, and we're very, very pleased to be joined by Chris Pattison from Front Door Collective. Welcome, Chris. Welcome. Thanks, today? Haley. Thanks, Ryan. How are you guys? Doing well. Good. Me good. too. I'm doing well. To yeah. Yeah. Same. It's good. It's good Friday, and it's a good Friday. So it exactly. works out. Good day for good day for a podcast, I guess. Yeah. All right. So, Chris, bear with me for about 27 seconds while I read your bio and um, tout your great um, credentials, and um, you can just smile and nod. All right. So, Chris Pattison, you can call him C Pat is the Chief Technology Officer and Chief Information Security Officer at Front Door Collective, a unique nationwide network of partners dedicated to providing best-in-class e-commerce delivery experiences. He specializes in driving and scaling digital transformation. Before Front Door, Chris spent over a decade at FedEx in various roles, including Director of IT, Transaction Risk, Countermeasures and Intelligence, and Managing Director of Security, Data Research and Analysis. Um, so again, welcome. I, I will want to hear more about um, your experience in intelligence and what is countermeasures with a capital C. Yeah, so a lot of that ties back into information security risk when we were doing a lot of work around fraud. So, so really countermeasures there are as you start to detect the threats, being proactive about addressing the risks and having the countermeasures there, you know, whether it's a, you know, a virtual adversary or in a lot of cases we, you know, Obviously, in the shipping industry, you're, you're dealing uh, with fraudsters of different sorts, and, the, and then there are even more malicious actors out there. So, uh, always being on a proactive stance from a risk management perspective is, is key there. So that's, that team was heavy into data science and working and, and focusing on, on how do we get ahead of these problems before they become much larger yeah. issues. So under your watch, did you stay ahead of the bad guys, would you say? Like, who won? Oh, yeah. Well, so they it's very interesting as they change their tactics. Uh, as soon as you change and, and build a set of countermeasures, they will go out and, and look at, OK, we, we've got to change our, our uh, tactics as well. So it's a cat and mouse game, much like yeah. you know, anything you'd see dealing with crime or those things. Uh, it's, it's very common to have to go through and, and deal with that as it changes over time. But it seems like one of those things like intelligence or, or whatever, if something doesn't happen, you're doing your job well, right? So it's like uh, you yeah, celebrate yeah. the time that you've, no one hears about the things that you've done properly because nothing happens. So that's-, that's Yeah, and, and there's a lot of work in that space in, in doing uh, risk quantification. So doing Monte Carlo simulations, you can actually get to a point where you can quantify the impact of, of uh, risk on uh, ROI or return on countermeasures, right? So where do I make the right investments to keep those things from happening? So there's a huge space. We could we could do a whole separate podcast on that and bring some some people in. Uh, but that is that is very common now is that to try to get ahead of this and actually start to measure it, uh, even in the cases where something bad doesn't happen. No, that's very cool. We're um, obviously very technically friendly, and that's kind of our. Uh, our mission uh, at Conservancy ESG is to uh, scale an ESG platform uh, and be the system of record for environmental, social, and governance uh, issues and performance and results and, you know, allow people to measure that. So this is an, an ESG podcast. Feel free to tell us as much more as you want about your background. And then, of course, we're interested in making that connection. I saw some of the social impact things that Front Door is trying to do just on the website and some of the things that you've done and followed uh, on LinkedIn, but, but what led to your interest in ESG, we'll, we'll ask specifically. Yeah, it, you know, it, it first started probably back when I was working on carbon credit calculators uh, at FedEx as, as part of our compliance work to, to some of the EU regulations. But I, I think the real turning point for me as it relates to ESG was you know, at the height of the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. It's when the companies took out that full page ad in the New York Times, right? That's something I'd never seen before. And, you know, it really piqued my curiosity is what led to that level of action uh, by those organizations. 
you know, and, and it started to lean towards, are, are they concerned about the, their social scores as far as ESG scoring, uh, you know, and it was clear to me, I think, that, that while the G in ESG is kind of how well you manage your company, it's, it's no longer the only thing, right? It's, it's how your shareholders, you know, are looking at how you're performing socially. It is, you know, are you looking to, to work with the environment from uh, some of the work that's being done in different green initiatives and carbon credits and things along that line? So, so it's clear that, that just managing a company isn't the only thing, you know, the governance side. Uh, that's going to deliver uh, shareholder value and see, you know, impact your stock price. But it is these uh, social and environment efforts as well that are, that are being tracked much more closely, I think, than they ever have been, have been before. I think there were always good initiatives at companies, but, but now that's actually getting into, you know, measuring and managing it and reporting on it. It's very different, uh, you know, almost a level where, where it's getting into SEC type reporting. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you say, you know, that the there's a risk management or governance focus. And we've heard some folks talk about how that's kind of table stakes. If you're going to trust someone as a fund manager or as a you know fiduciary steward of your of your capital, um, they better have governance, right? Now, from where we came up through in our business through commercial real estate, for us it was like the E that was the table stakes. The the yep. built environment was very focused on the E for many years. And now they're also expanding more into the S and the G. It's not just about energy, water, waste, carbon. It your physical properties, but there are other components. Um, so what do you believe is the relationship between governance, risk, and compliance? Like, how do they all come together? And what do you think the next five years looks like? Yeah, it's, you know, governance is a clear overlap, right? That, that's been there. It's, it's how you're managing the risk to your organization. What are those processes? How are you dealing uh, with the regulatory nature of, of, of business? But, you know, poor handling of ESG posture, you know, is clearly getting much more focus. Uh, it, it tends to, from what I'm seeing right now, impact public companies more than private because, you know, these public companies, if you have a, a poor ESG posture, you may get excluded from certain ESG, you know, traded funds that are out there now. And, you know, I was actually talking with my cousin up in Chicago and her portfolio is, you know, completely uh, balanced around ESG type companies. And that was another kind of aha moment that this was really starting to impact uh, the way investors look to, to choose uh, where they put their money and the companies they they back. So, you know, if you're a public company and you're not paying attention to this, you know, there is a risk to your stock price. And, you know, that's probably the single biggest risk for for any organization, especially public companies. But but I think they're starting to take notice and, and there are lots of uh, opportunities you know, to get their arms around that and start to manage it better. Yeah, I find that very interesting. Uh, you know, the, the public companies have to do such detailed reporting. And, and now that, you know, that's our vision as Conservancy ESG is that just simply being measured by your financial performance doesn't necessarily tell us if you're actually a good company or a valuable company or a company that we right. want to cheer for. Uh, if we know that you're having perhaps a positive impact on the environment and your community and social aspects, oh, and you're doing well financially and profitably and that kind of stuff, then I can say, great, you're a good company that I want to, to root for. And the public markets allow people, I have friends and family, I've mentioned this before, but friends and family who for the first time are going to put money into public markets because you know, they had such a, a, a rough um, interpretation or repu of the reputation of, of corporations and Fortune 500 that they didn't want to do it until now that they have these options uh, to have some confidence that particular funds are impact funds or at least have reasonable uh, ESG scores and that sort of thing. So that's very interesting. And what we're trying to do is help bring that same uh, pressure, if you will, or, or give the tools to work through that pressure to the private market. So we actually spend a lot of time um, servicing private equity and um, and general partners so that they can that, that they see that this is what having the public markets it's coming to the private markets too so so you know we're excited about that you seem to know a lot about the topic and follow it closely what else do you think um will happen maybe even the second half of 2022 any other thoughts on different sectors or yeah does this start to become a must-have yeah, I, th I think it's different, you know, by sector and industry for sure. You know, if you think of energy companies or logistics companies like Front Door Collective, we clearly have to have a, a close eye, you know, on carbon footprints. But, you know, I've got a background in manufacturing as well with, with Black & Decker and, you know, the social side of who I do business with overseas, you know, from a child labor perspective or, you know, how I'm sourcing things 
you know, that's that's very different for them on, on the social side where that may not have been kind of under the scrutiny of the public eye as much as it's been in the past. So, you know, as I've seen it, especially working in governance or risk and compliance with the team at LogicGate uh, and their platform, you know, I got to talk to uh, customers from a broad array of industries and you can see that they had different focuses. Uh, a lot of the uh, electric providers and, you know, power companies, energy providers uh, are now publishing their ESG reports uh, out right along their SEC reporting on their website. So it's a very critical uh, for them to be dealing with this. But as, as far as 2022 uh, goes, it is probably going to set up to be the, the most interesting uh, year for ESG from my perspective. I mean, just starting off with, uh, you know, the conflict in Ukraine, that's been interesting to watch, right? The number of companies that have been pulling businesses out of Russia, you know, and, and you know, not either sourcing things from them. Uh, that's a very interesting response to me. Uh, and the assumption is going to weigh heavily, you know, how people dealt with this. Is it going to tie into their scoring when they get reassessed uh, in, in the coming years? How much is that going to, to be a part of it? And then the other clear thing, we're all seeing this right now, is just the turmoil in the energy markets. You know, what's going to happen with that, right? You know, is it going to lead to more forgiveness on environmental scoring because, you know, just the, the lack of, uh, you know, fossil fuels in the supply chain are now it's starting to impact people so socially, right? So you almost have the, the E and the S competing with each other. It's getting harder and harder for people to get by. Uh, we're already seeing some of the pressure from that. If, if you go back and look at the inquiries on Capitol Hill uh, just in the past couple of weeks. So uh, economics is really kicking on in the environmental sector. And what, what is that going to mean for us in ESG scoring? It's, it's one of those things I don't have the crystal ball to, to get ahead of, but, but I think in retrospect, it's going to, it's going to change a lot of what we've seen uh, from the ESG perspective, probably highlighted as, as, you know, we continue to dive deep into what's going on there. It's interesting how you talk about, too, you know, ESG really ties into all the current world happenings, right? So like the sanctions in Russia, there are ESG implications there, the prices of oil, there are ESG implications there. So as someone who's been in this space, you know, for the entirety of my career for about 20 years to see it go from being, oh, the green team to the sustainability committee to now um, this concept of ESG that's boardroom driven, that's, you know, top of um, interest that impacts global happenings um, and it, as it should. So, um, yeah, so that's a good point. Like the, a lot of the sanctions were imposed by the government, but, but what you've seen, and that's, that's exactly right. Haley is, uh, Haley is, um, it gets into the fact that these companies, they weren't told by the government to do this. They went and did this on their own, right? They said, yeah. we're not doing business with you anymore. So it was, it was that that responsibility piece of the corporations I, I found most interesting. Like sanctions, you can do things like change banking, and 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 those are regulatory things typically driven by the governments. I think this is the first time, and what makes this quite different is that the you know the companies are actually stepping in and taking action as well, and on a scale I don't think we've seen before. Yeah, and to your point, yeah, it's voluntary. So, um, so Chris, I'll, I'll try to make the CPAT thing work. So CPAT it doesn't feel <laughs> yeah, right yet, go. maybe by the end of the podcast. Um, so that's kind of a good segue. And I like how you phrase this. Um, S is the most unforgiving ESG pillar. Uh, why Absolutely. do you think that way? Yeah, let's hear. Well, you know, if, if you look at GRC platforms, you know, like Logic Gate, it's easier to manage the things you're, you're used to, to governing, right? So regulations from a compliance perspective, you know, environmental scoring is you were bringing up even the real estate sector, you know, leads buildings, you know, different carbon credits, that there are ways to tie metrics around it. In the social realm, you can do it from a certain extent as it relates to, you know, diversity of your workforce and your team. You know, you're, and we talked a little bit about the use of overseas labor practices, but for social, it, I, I, you know, I think it gets really tricky to start to measure, uh, you know, something like inclusion inside of an organization. What does that really look like to, to actually measure that? Because uh, you're really getting into that company's culture, right? And how it impacts the, the internal or parts of the organization as well as the outside world. Uh, and, I, and I know in the EU, there's, there's quite a bit of work to try to start to wrap metrics around it. But, you know, measuring that culture is, 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 is going to be tricky. And we've seen people that have, you know, recently made attempts to do something good socially and then it, you know, it can backfire on them. Right. Uh, for me in the security industry, this is always a challenge, you know, especially in InfoSec. You know, some companies will, hey, we want to get out and let people know about the breach very early. And, you know, we've seen CEOs stumble, you know, whether it was the solar winds breach or even recently with what was going on with Okta. You know, sometimes uh, they make statements because they didn't plan for it, right? They didn't 
maybe have a GRC platform where they were thinking about uh, resiliency and risk in the business and crisis planning. Uh, and then we've seen other companies that have held out longer. And sometimes it's law enforcement that tells them to do this, but they don't notify the breach immediately. They don't let their customers know. Uh, and in those cases, they also kind of get hit. So uh, it can be tricky that, you know, the best intentions uh, as you're trying to impact those social scores uh, can backfire on you. And so, so pre-planning, using your risk planning software, using your scenario planning, uh, and getting ahead of that is very important. Something we spent a lot of time, uh, even formally when I was at FedEx, you know, there were there were tabletop exercises and planning planning things we went through. It's like, oh, we have to do that again, but it but it's important, right? And and some of the other podcasts I've talked about, it's like, I mean, you guys are in real estate, right? Fire drills. Remember when we were all in the office and once a year, everybody had to pick up and walk out of the building and find your buddy or whatever that process was. But you know, do Still we do, do that for, for the six yeah, of us that yeah, remain in the office? Yeah, Still the six do. of you that are there. Yeah. But do you do that for information security or some of these other crises and things that are? Yeah. I mean, what are the odds of a fire burning down the building? It's right. there, but I can tell you, your ransomware attack or something like that's probably much higher risk for your organization. And these things are not in the planning systems. Folks are still doing them in spreadsheet. They're not linking it to the other parts of the organization. And you know, we're talking about how GRC starts to tie into all this risk management, whether it's ESG perspective or crisis management around uh, one of these events, uh, you have to give that the forethought, get the planning out there, have some tools that help remind you, you know, hey, it's time for us to go do this. Here are the parties involved. Let's update this and make sure the right contacts are in there. Uh, it's, it's very important to their whole risk management perspective, uh, not just from an ESG perspective, but, you know, company resilience and integrity as well. Yeah, I totally, it makes sense now. I mean, S could be in theory the most abstract, but if you don't manage it properly, it could be the most detrimental, could be yeah. uh, fatal even, right? You could take, you could do a, a CEO, he or she could go out there and just say one thing that seems innocuous. And then because they didn't think about it in the broader context or what may be happening out, you know, kind of in the, in the world in general. I mean, how many times have we seen it happen? It's almost like it put a palm in the face kind of event. It's like, oh, I wish I could take that back. And you know, Twitter and the internet and all that stuff, it's, it's forever, right? Can't get rid of it. Yeah, and I appreciate your commentary about the complexity of some of it and even the fact that um, E and S are sometimes, you know, pulling against each other. And what, what I'm enjoying is that just because it's complex and so it, it, sometimes you say it's too complex or it doesn't make sense or the social thing can't be measured, so don't measure, whatever. But now we're like, that's not acceptable. Like we're having the conversations, we're trying to figure it out. Oh, it's complex. Cool. Well, then let's really roll up our sleeves and get smart people working on it and figure out how to make, you know, should you sacrifice um, a way that you develop, uh, you know, fuel your cars? Should you say, should we make that a little bit more unfriendly so that we have better social capabilities to get around? You know, I mean, very yeah. complex, but smart people are working on it. And then we can make decisions and do the best that we can. So I'm, I'm glad that we're progressing, even though it, it is complex. I think that's that's great. And I, I like, you know, how you said, um, you know, the front page ads in the in the paper kind of brought everyone's attention. The, well, first of all, I'm happy that corporations are making these steps. It's giving us faith, you know, that it doesn't have to be regulation. They actually there are they're just corporations at the end are people making decisions and they're actually tending to make proper decisions sometimes. So that's great. Um, but to that whole point of, you know, the last few years really shining a light on everything, uh, is ESG or impact investing a fad that the light's been shined on, resulting from COVID and a surge of emphasis on social issues, or is it here to stay? Or how will our relationship with social impact reporting continue to evolve? What are your insights on that? Yeah, I, I think it's one of those things that's you're not going to be able to to COVID COVID shifted a lot. You're not going to be able to put that genie back in the bottle, right? I, I've, I've mentioned this too. You know, COVID created something that was as radical as the industrial revolution or computer or internet revolution, right? Uh, it, we're not. Go, it's not going back in. You know, how are you going to manage risks in this new world? Uh, is it part of your risk planning scenarios? Where is it in your strategy? You know. No one wants to pay for a lot of empty buildings or facilities that are not configured for, you know, a hybrid working environment. Uh, so, so looking at that, you guys are in real estate, right? There's real estate risk that's coming out of this. So as far as going back, I, I, I don't think, uh, you know, from that perspective, COVID's created a lot of change. 
I think the the highlight on how businesses are operating uh, and the social uh, responsibility and environmental responsibility, I think it's also here to stay uh, because it, it's in the light now and it's something that's that's moving forward. Uh, you know, I, I can't see how it'll be interesting. I guess anything's possible these days. You know, I can't see how somebody can say, well, we don't care about, you know, how we look out in the in the general community anymore uh, because their competition may still be highlighting that. And maybe they're not getting ESG scores, uh, but there are a lot of organizations that were doing this under corporate responsibility. Healy brought up uh, some of the other things that were already out there. You know, they're doing it to attract talent. They're doing it to attract investors. So I, I think it's it's there moving forward. I think COVID did trigger uh, a lot of changes in the, in the way we work and the way we interact. And, and in some cases, being more together, I, you know, I see a lot of people online more now in Zoom than, than maybe I did. Uh, you know, they were always on telephone calls working at FedEx, right? At overseas call. At least I can see people now, right? Hey, I haven't seen you in a long time. How's it going? Uh, so, so there are positives and negatives to it. I do think we're, it's going to be more of a hybrid world moving forward. And we haven't even talked about virtual reality and all that stuff that's, that's also kicking in. I like the perspective that you equate it to the industrial revolution or kind of when computers started becoming mainstream, because I do think there's still um, a subset of people, maybe even the majority subset of people that are like waiting for it to go back to normal or waiting for yeah. it to go back. Like, I think they still haven't quite accepted that this is normal now and that, you do, know, do you remember, do you remember what those people are called? You remember the name? Uh, this is the industrial revolution quiz. In, in light, Luddite, uh, Luddites. Luddites. Ludding. The, fo the followers, the followers of Ed Ludd, right? So Ed Ludd was the guy that led the attack on the cotton gins, right? He had these people come in that that uh, ah. were going to destroy all the cotton gins, and so so they are. The, the term is Luddites. They tried to go backwards, and uh, they did not succeed. I guess I uh, forgot everything from AP history, maybe on purpose. That one slipped, that one slipped my mind. I work, I work for FedEx and Fred Smith, and he is the master of history. I don't know how he remembers things. So uh, lot, lots of good lessons from Fred there. Yeah, yeah. But it's, um, I mean, it's kind of true. Like if, if you're resistant to change, you'll hate being obsolete or all those kind of cliches, but you got to just kind of roll with it, you know, and can't be waiting for things to go back to normal. So um, you've got, you've got to, you've got to just plan and prepare or you're, you're going, you, your company or your organization is going to suffer, right? You have to be willing yeah. to change for the times. Yeah. There's actually you just reminded me. So AP history, too far gone. Um, I do remember from business school though, there was a case study we looked at from Kodak where Kodak made the strategic decision to not go digital, you know, when all the cameras- It's a good one. Coming out. Yeah, yeah, there's like, nope, we're gonna stick with the 35 millimeter film. That's the staple, this digital thing's a fad. And, you know, we all know how that story ended. So um, yeah, and maybe in, in some cases that gamble might've been correct, but in that case, it wasn't. Um, it made it to be a famous case study um, for business school students, but- um, yeah, yeah, there's a whole there's a whole ream. I'll drop it out there for the audience. Uh, uh, Clayton Christensen, I think, has since passed away. He was with Harvard. But uh, his book, The uh, Innovator's Dilemma, is littered with companies that just like did not innovate and, and where they fell apart and made missteps and a lot of deep exploration of that. And he, he was very well known for his work there. Yeah. And of course, a double edged sword. If you're too far on the cutting or the bleeding edge, you know, and you risk it all, you could be wrong a lot of yep. time, probably yep. more often than you're right. You're just, um, you're just making, you're making my risk management ties to everything much easier. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, I had pulled something off your website that I liked. So you said FedEx, your time at FedEx instilled in you the power of diversity. Um, I'm obviously intrigued by that statement, but uh, how so was it one moment or, you know, an event or a couple of events that, that fueled that yeah, for you or was it just all your time spent? It's, it, it's interesting, you know, even prior to ESG and all this, you know, FedEx has always had uh, a focus on being very diverse, you know, long, long before this, this made in the mainstream. Uh, it, it probably and likely has some ties to the fact that, you know, they're based in Memphis, which is the, the center of the civil rights movement. Uh, but always in, in management training, uh, it's things that Mr. Smith, you know, brought to bear on, on the organization. Uh, you know, how, how are these things handled? You know, no, no company ever gets it 100% correct, but my experience you know, HR and management teams were very focused on dealing with situations, you know, if, the, if it looked like, you know, the diversity in the organization was off, there was, you know, planning around that. Uh, and, and even if it, there were disciplinary situations, they, they nine out of 10 times, I think they dealt with as quickly and, and correctly as possible. But, but really at the core of all that is uh, something Mr. Smith started very early on, uh, very well documented business case as well, but it's this idea of uh, 
people, service, and profit, right? So if you take care of your people and you do the right things by your people, uh, they'll provide great service to the customer, which which ultimately leads to profit, which you should be taking your profits and then giving them back to your people and sending them to to do better work. So it's a, the proverbial FedEx three-legged stool. Uh, you know, that was further taken. Uh, Lori Tucker was my SVP, you know, pioneer in the e-commerce space. She's since retired, but uh, she took that a bit further. And this is, goes back to the early 2000s. Uh, you know, Lori said, you know, she took, she said, we have to have people first, right? It, you know, we have PSP, but we need to put people first. And those are, you know, philosophies that started to carry on, you know, through the 2000s in organizations, through a lot of uh, other program. Uh, but those are philosophies. You know, there are a few FedExers, uh, you know, at Front Door Collective. Uh, you're seeing that in in some of the things we're already focusing on, even as a very small group. But, uh, you know, Dan, our, our CEO, is very focused on making sure we begin to add and, and continue to bring that concept uh, into our culture. So um, that it really was at FedEx is a lot of learning and, and kind yeah. of seeing how how it benefited the company, how that very diverse team of people. And, and you could tell you get in the rooms, you get you know, just very different ideas and opinions. And yeah. it all comes from our upbringing or, you know, different cultures and things along that line. And and I do think it, it helped drive the success of the organization over the years and global and the ability to expand globally too. A lot of people went overseas. Yeah. They brought a lot of overseas team members, you know, back into the States. Um, you know, that, that helped also improve the culture and, and make it become the global superpower it is. Yeah, and I do laud people that truly believe that the diversity makes a difference in the business, you know, makes a different, makes an actual impact versus the people that are a little bit of box checkers. Like, yeah, we got to do this diversity thing here. We get some different diversity because I've experienced it. I mean, I sit on, I sat on two boards in, you know, my professional career and I really, I'm not trying to have a different perspective. I'm not trying to be different. I simply do because of my demographic and it yep. does add richness to the conversation. Um, it does help folks see around corners that they might not otherwise see around. So I'm a believer, but, um, and it's, and to me, it's really more than just checking boxes to meet requirements because I've seen, you know, the impact and the difference that it makes, especially in the boardroom. Absolutely. I'll tell you something very impressive. One, maybe this says something about me, but one of the coolest things I've ever done was tour the FedEx facility in Memphis. Yeah. Um, super hub. Where all those planes land in the short amount of time and the logistics and the these carts whizzing by i'm like well there's definitely going to be an accident but nope the timing is perfect and it just works and everything is tracked and someone's like oh there's a package not showing up where it's supposed to be between you know i mean it's narrowed down to like 40 feet and then someone up oh, there it is who gets it back it, that was a wild impressive thing so if the downstream yeah. effects of the operations you know are likely because of uh the kind of uh, richness in, in leadership that came came from it. Yeah, and it all happens in a matter of three or four hours total, right? Fr start to finish, it's done. It was <laughs> it was wild. We we were actually, I think they were a client of ours for a little bit, one of my companies. And so we got this like behind the scenes tour and, and it was just so impressive. So speaking of logistics, let's talk a little bit about uh, Front Door Collective. Uh, sure. Very cool. Um, obviously it's, I think it'll interest everyone because probably everybody is engaging at this point, uh, especially, you know, you talk about the last mile. Um, we talk about the last mile in digital and metaphorical ways a lot. You're actually talking about um, working with the people that set the packages on your door or in your door or whatever. Um, so yeah, what is, um, what is so challenging about that, that space right now? Yeah. I mean, so I, I've said this before, right? Good, good logistics is getting, something from point A to point B, right? Great logistics, being able to deal with all the exceptions and bumps along the way and still make those service commitments. You know, what we're trying to build and, and our building at the Front Door Collective is really exceptional logistics, right? It's ability to plan ahead for those exceptions, you know, using data science, using the commitment of, of the uh, team members in the network, the diversity of, of the collective and to, it's to overcome those challenges and meet and potentially beat those service levels and it really, you know, that's a big part of why my background in risk management, even though I've been away from logistics for, you know, core logistics for four or five years now, uh, great to be back on the team because we're, we're going to bring uh, risk management perspectives and, and data science into that. But, but back to kind of our ESG uh, philosophy and talking about the social side of things, you know, it takes us back to that people first thing, right? For us, you know, that's the key. Too many companies, you know, 
the frontline operators are no longer the focus of the model. It's it's become more profits, right? So it's not people first anymore. Uh, and that puts that PSP model out of kilter. So what we're doing is, you know, nobody knows these markets like our delivery partners in their cities, in their neighborhoods. They know the neighbors. They know it far better than anybody that's in the administrative arm, you know, of the front door collective. So we're building that network of, of these partners in these in these cities to do this. And then the challenge will be to, to maintain and, and keep that people first focus, but we're building the, the models and the structures that are doing that. Uh, and, and it's gonna evolve with some unique technology we're bringing and we're gonna set the stage for uh, that exceptional service uh, you know, by keeping those people first. And it's something when I, years ago, I worked for UPS and to, to even get into management UPS back in the eighties, you had to either drive a route during peak or, or at least go help a driver, right? So you had yeah. to be that operator and, you know, with challenges in getting people hired and, and other things culturally, they, they got a little bit away from that. At FedEx, you know, we used to be able to go out and help sort at peak and, and do ride alongs and jump seat. I've, I've been, you know, ridden on freighters all over the place. Uh, but, but some of that's been lost over time. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to bring some of that back. We're really focusing very closely on the people that do these jobs day to day. And, and hence, you know, the term, the collective is, is we're here to, facilitate and help get them, you know, volume into their networks. Uh, we're here to help facilitate, you know, delivering great service. But at the end of the day, it really is, you know, those partners and it's their business, not ours. And, and how do we drive that and, and build a, a better e-commerce experience, right, to, to get to those exceptional logistics? Yeah, I'll tell you the first time I heard, you know, I, I grew up in the, the customer first perspective, which makes sense. I mean, that's every business, you know, cares very much about the customer. That's what makes it work. And when I first heard the idea of employee first, um, it took a while for me to consume. And the idea that, um, you know, we talk about this net promoter score thing, well, you're never going to have a customer performance or service for your customers that's, that's higher or better than the way that your people feel about your own organization and your own thing. So uh, I thought that was quite interesting when we say people first, uh, specifically employee first. And if you do well there, you can do well for your customers. But, but, you know, that was after 15 years of customer, customer, customer at the sake of yourself almost, um, which, you know, maybe is, is less sustainable. So it's, it, I find that all very interesting. Yeah. Not, and not disparaging FedEx either. I mean, they, they, uh, they, there's the station managers and the, a lot of those folks on the road do some amazing things every day for, for people. You can, you know, sometimes, like you said, the, the good things you know, get whitewashed by the, the bad things of, you know, package tossing and things like that. But every day uh, in these networks, there, there are people making sacrifices, whether, whether it's the front door collective network or, or FedEx's network, but, but, you know, they have to believe in what they're doing, believe in, in what they're doing for the product. And, the, and that leads to, to great things. So, big tie the social scores and how you treat your people internally. All right, so I must go there. This has nothing to do with anything we've discussed whatsoever, but on your LinkedIn profile, um, obviously you're Tennessee based, you've spent 23 years and some change as part of something called the Barbecue Republic. I can't not inquire. <laughs> Barbecue Republic, front, front door collective, right? Uh, I cannot take credit for, for the Barbecue Republic, unfortunately. It was uh, founded before, and that name was granted, they, they started as the, the Moscow Porkies or something like that, uh, Porky Pigs or something. They started as a shoulder team, but then by the next year, they moved to, to being a whole hog team. Uh, but it's also unique, too. It's a lot of these competition teams are restauranteers, like a, a, an actual restaurant or it's a mm -hmm. social group or, you know, the company's paying for one of these teams. But this arose out of just a group of uh 20 or 30 guys that got together. Some of us, you know, had cooked in college. Other people did own restaurants. Uh, so got together and, and you know, as a core, uh, started started cooking hogs together. So we've been uh, we've been in competing in Memphis, May for for nearly 30 years in some of the ancillary contests that are around there. It's it's been a lot of fun. Uh, some people have come and gone, but there's there's still a core team there. Uh, it's scary that some of us are, are are a little bit grayer than we used to be when this all started. Uh, but but looking forward to being back up. I'm down in New Orleans now, but but uh, going back up for uh, Memphis in May and hope, hoping to see lots of supporters and all our, our good friends who, that we've had over the years there. It sounds like an awesome hobby. We actually did have an employee that um, opened my eyes to the fact that there was a competitive scene for barbecue. Oh, yeah. um, had no idea. And then someone just recently in our all company meeting said that they and their dad had won first place in a sauce, like a sauce. Oh, yeah. 
Yep. So um, as someone who mainly goes into my kitchen to like get water, um, I, I'm impressed and that's pretty cool. Yeah, we, we got first place in sauce last year. It was the, uh, you know, it's hard to get first place in these competitions, right? Cause you're up against, you know, these, these uh, restaurants you see on the food channel, right? So anytime you kind of even beat them, even if you don't win the whole thing, if I, if you beat out one of these major groups, it's always kind of, you know, a little, a little ribbing and, and jabbing of each other. You know, they're all a bunch of crazy people from Memphis just wiped out our international team on this, you know, on this giant, uh, on this giant competition. So we, we always have fun competing. It's, it's a lot of good fun. Did you watch the um, documentary? What was that chef? He wrote the book kitchen confidential. And then um, he was eating weird things as part of his bit. He, he ended up, committing suicide not not too long ago oh remember this, this oh, Bourdain. Uh, Is it Bourdain? Uh, anthony bourdain anthony bourdain yeah uh i watched a documentary recently it's uh, very interesting by the yeah, way we've we over the years i think al roker many many years ago interviewed us and we've been on tv and in a couple of events so it's 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 become a thing right you turn on the food channel see this stuff it's it's very different than it was back in uh 92 93 when we started this thing yeah well, Chris, um, we've got a little hook here to, that keeps our, our, our listeners all the way to the end. Um, I'm sure they, they're staying anyway, because I really appreciate your expertise and, and the great conversation we had. But we've got one little quiz for you. This is a very uh -oh. simple uh, thing we're going to do. It's called Beans or Beer. And all you have to do is tell me, I'm going to tell you a company name. And all you have to do is tell me if uh, it is a craft beer place or a craft coffee place, oh, all right? In this world of artists and things. I'm just going to say the name and all you have to do is say if it's- I better, not, I better not fail at this because I consume copious amounts of both. So we'll, we'll, ah, see, we'll see what happens here. There's an extra twist on this one. It's a French uh, word, two words, and I'm going to slaughter the pronunciation. So you're going to have to navigate my poor French to figure this out, but it's called Bruy Carré or Carré. Bruy Carré. Something- quarter gray so carré i'm the, the, going the with carré is c-a-r-r-e yeah yeah i'm gonna go with uh beer on that one that is correct it is on the edge of frenchman street which is yes, a great little run in new orleans there yes and i know exactly what i gathered <laughs> was um the carré means edge uh which quarter. i thought it was i think it means quarter. quarter i think so i could be wrong my french isn't as good <laughs> Yeah, I use the translator. I think it means edge, but either okay. way, quarter edge. Um, yeah, I thought it was, uh, you know, we were talking about kind of some of the innovative or on the edge things. And that's, that's kind of what this, this organization does. They want to brew like they're like, we'll give you the staples, but we're brewing some wild stuff, too. We're always trying to innovate, do stuff that's out there on the edge. Um, so, yeah, maybe check it out uh, next time you're, you're in New Orleans or, or down at the uh, on Frenchman Street, which is one of my favorite places in the country, by the way, is that that Frenchman Street. Absolutely. Uh, bit. All right. Well, um, Brian, if your translation skills are as good as your pronunciation skills in French, then I'm going to go with Chris's suggestion on the translation. Well, well wait, hey, be careful. I'm not, don't. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> and for the record, when we don't have guests, um, Ryan asks me, and I think I get it wrong, like nine out of 10 times. So good job. You're one for one. Yes. Congratulations. Yeah. You're correct. I forgot Work. to congratulate yeah. you. The The prize of uh, our congratulations has been provided. So congratulations. That's right. Excellent. All right. So thank you again, um, CPAT, and to our hundreds of thousands of listeners for joining us on the ESG Experience podcast. There's a new episode every month. So if you enjoyed your time with us, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast directory. The name of our next episode, Trash Talk, um, it's going to be a good one, and it will be brought to you by our very own uh, Conservice ESG Dex Madsen and Heidi Stenvig, two subject matter experts that are extremely passionate about waste management, as well as um, Adam Cervinkus, who is a freegan. If you don't know what that is, you'll have to tune in to find out. Um, and again, thanks to our loyal subscribers for continuing to listen and follow us on your favorite social media channel at hashtag ESG experience. Um, and thanks again to CPAT from HLEV and Ryanel. Ryanel, thank at, you, CPAT. At, at, at Risk Regular on Twitter. So if you guys want to follow me, it'd be great to see everyone. Thanks again. This is a lot it, of fun. What was it again? Say it again. At, at Risk Regular.
Chris at Wrangler. Chris Wrangler. With a cowboy hat. <laughs> Got it. Thanks again, Chris. Much appreciated. Bye, Thanks, everybody. guys. We'll see you soon.